Good evening. My name is Selena Joffrey, and I'm the Director of Business and Policy at Asia Society Texas Center. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's program is on the topic of the future of U.S.-Iran relations under the Biden administration. Since the Trump administration removed the U.S. from the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, tensions between the two countries have escalated significantly. With President Biden now in office, there are new questions on what the future U.S. policy towards Iran might look like, including concerns over Iran's nuclear program. Will the U.S. take steps to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal? Will Iran agree to re-enter the deal? And will it comply with its regulations? There are also concerns about Iran's upcoming elections and the evolving dynamics within the region. To address some of these topics, we're honored to have with us Dr. Vali Nasser, Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies and former Dean of School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Nasser has advised senior American policymakers, including presidents, Secretary of State, senior members of the Congress, and presidential campaigns. He's the author of several books and has written extensively for scholarly journals and numerous media networks. Our moderator is Nick Schifrin. Our moderator is Nick Schifrin, who's the Foreign Affairs and Defense Correspondent for PBS NewsHour. He leads NewsHour's foreign reporting and has created week-long in-depth series for NewsHour focusing on several countries. He's the recipient of several awards, including the Peabody Award, the National Press Club Award, and the Overseas Press Club Award. Following the program, we'll be taking some viewer questions. So please share your questions via the YouTube comment box. Before we get started, I would like to share that Asia Society is an educational institution promoting cross-cultural understanding for a more inclusive world. Many of Asia Society's programs like this one are free. Please consider supporting our work through a tax deductible gift by texting Asia Society TX to 243725. We hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Selena, thank you so much. Um, Bali, Dr. Nasser, uh, pleasure to see you and thank you all for joining us. Um, it is a topic uh, that I think will come uh, to the top of the news quite quickly and one of the main foreign policy aspects of the Biden administration uh, early on. And, and so if I could just take a minute to set the stage um, a little bit, and that'll kind of start our conversation here. Uh, so as Selena said, it was about three years ago the Trump administration withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal, uh, or JCPOA. And the Trump administration launched uh, what it called maximum pressure. Uh, more than 1,500 people and entities were sanctioned. Iran was barred from selling oil, and the Trump administration said that revenues were down to the point where Iran only had about eight or $10 billion uh, of, of foreign reserves uh, as foreign currency in reserve, uh, and that that pressure reduced Iran's ability to uh, have malign behavior across the region, most notably how much it could support proxies, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and, and down in Yemen. Uh, and then there was a series of high profile killings. Uh, of course, Qasem Soleimani, the Quds Force commander, uh, Abu Mahandi, uh, Mahdi al-Mahandis, uh, the head of Iraqi PMF, um, part of the Iraqi security forces, but allied with Iran, they were both killed in a drone strike. Uh, also the death of Abu Muhammad al-Masri in Tehran, uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, most recently the head of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and we came close to war. Uh, that much many senior officials at the time told me in, in early January after the, the Soleimani killing. Critics continued to say throughout this time that that policy was making Iran's behavior more malign. Uh, and that Iran's nuclear program advanced well past uh, the restrictions that were imposed by the Iran nuclear deal, uh, including the enrichment of up to 20% of uranium as opposed to 3.67, uh, the stockpiling of more um, fuel, 
uh, and um, also the building of uranium core. Uh, and then we also, critics pointed out, had the proxy um, uh, organizations continue, whether Houthis in Yemen, which we'll talk about extensively, or Hezbollah in, in Syria. So as the Biden administration came in, that was the, uh, the scene in the region and, and between US and Iran. And of course, as Selene just said, Biden administration promises to get back uh, in the deal, and it promises to get back in the deal only after Iran gets back in the deal. And we'll talk about that sequencing. And the Biden administration promises that rejoining the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, will lead to uh, a better deal, uh, a bigger deal, uh, dealing with Iran's proxies and missiles. So that brings us to Vali Nasser. The question of the night, Vali, uh, is the title, deal or no deal? What should the Biden administration do? So first of all, let me uh, also thank uh, Asia Society uh, Houston for inviting us uh, both to this uh, event, the timely event, and it's wonderful being back. Uh, I wish it could have been in person, but uh, such is, such is uh, our, our situation now. And it's great to be with you, Nick, uh, and to have this conversation with you. I think uh, the, the Biden there are many reasons why the Biden administration should embrace a deal. The question is, how does it get to a deal and how quickly it gets to a deal? I mean, that's really the big debate. The reason why it should do so is because the reasons the United States left the deal has undermined its commitment to multilateral engagements around the world. And, and it had damaged America's credibility in terms of pursuing uh, diplomatic solutions to big problems. I mean, if you sign a deal, you have uh, other members of the Security Council plus Germany sign on to the deal. Iran, uh, the United Nations verifies that Iran has uh, uh, done its part of the deal on 12 consecutive occasions. And then you have a change of president and you withdraw from the deal. It doesn't really stand well for uh, future deals of such. How are you going to persuade North Korea or other countries down the road to, to accept deal making? So uh, if President Biden really wants to uh, take America back to the credibility it had before uh, Trump era, uh, dealing with the JCPOA is an important part of it. Secondly, and I think more importantly, uh, we are where we are, uh, which is we are a country that is now deeply divided politically. Uh, as we're speaking, the, the, the biggest headlines in this country are about impeaching a former president. We're going into an a, a, a area where you know, a group of Americans are now characterized by another one as, as terrorists. The other ones think that those in government are usurpers. There's threats of violence. The economy is not doing well and we're still in the grip of COVID. And we have signed up to a major confrontation or let's say rivalry with China, which most observers believe will be in a critical situation for the next decade. The last thing I think this administration would want is a major war in the Middle East that would require several hundred thousand troops, trillions of dollars, and, and another long period of engagement in the region. And the most obvious reason why the United States would go to war in the Middle East is over Iran's nuclear program. We're not gonna to go to war in the Middle East over Hezbollah or over Houthis or over any other issue, but we, we will potentially go to war over Iran's nuclear program. That, that was also the case in 2013, which is why President Obama ha thought he had to do the deal if he was gonna to pivot to Asia. So, so the logic of, of, um, of uh, bringing some kind of cadence between America's resources and America's goals re requires us to push down the Middle East as a high priority in our foreign policy and dedicate, dedicate more resources to China and other things. And that means, first and foremost, Iran's nuclear deal. Now, what President Trump wanted to do, a new, bigger, better deal, is Years, years of negotiations, if at all, and it's down, down the road, which means that you have to stay there and babysit Iran until you get there. The lowest hanging fruit is the deal that Iran is still in. And, and the other members of the Security Council plus Germany are still signatories here. So getting Iran to abide by the deal it's already in is much easier than trying to, to expand the deal to include other things. So I think Unless something happens that the Biden administration is inclined to go back in, but it's but it's not inclined to take the first step, and it's not inclined, and it doesn't know when it actually wants to do this. Um, it wants to do this. 
Um, so it's about 840. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes. Uh, and so um, Dr. Nasser and I will go back and forth a little bit and then we'll open up to your questions. So definitely start thinking about those. Uh, and as Bali Nasser knows uh, from his appearances on the News Hour, and perhaps some of you know, uh, I take pride in allowing the guest always to explain their perspective first. And then uh, I play devil's advocate. So, Bali, one more thing to explain about the administration's perspective, the Biden team's perspective, which of course, we can talk about this also if people want to, uh, but the personnel in the Biden team, many of them who are leading this effort, led the effort to get into the Iran nuclear deal. So the theory of the case is exactly as you laid out, uh, that's about US credibility, and it's about reducing tensions in the Middle East. Uh, the subsequent argument that they say is once those tensions are reduced, once that nuclear uh, program is at least not taken off the table, but um, uh, the, the the breakout time literally is is pushed uh, past a year or past a couple of years, then we can deal with Iran's other issues, the proxy support in the region, as well as the, the ballistic missile program. So what is the administration's argument for why once they do the Iran nuclear deal, then they can deal with some of these other issues that we know we have with Iran? Uh, it's actually a very good point. And I think uh, the, the fact that uh, so many people in the current administration sat at the nuclear negotiations in 2013 to 2015 also gave them a sense of what was possible and, and, and what was not possible. So they already in 2013, the United States knew that, that a comprehensive deal that included Hezbollah and, and missiles, et cetera, would mean negotiating with Iran forever. Uh, uh, and as you, as the negotiation sort of gets going, the issue that is most urgent for either side percolates to the top, and you end up focusing on on closing that deal. And then, if you're successful there, you go to the next one. So uh, I think the United States is back to where it was in 2013. Uh, the most urgent issue is Iran's nuclear program. And Nick, the Iranians have been waiting for Biden. I think the theory, at least among the, the, the majority of Iranian elite was that it doesn't make sense risking war with Trump, keep your head down, particularly the last year, and just get to January 20th, and let's see whether there's going to be a change in American policy. Now that you have a new administration, the Iranians are showing their hand as to where this can go. They've started enriching 20%. They let it be known that that they that they've created a small amount of uranium metal, which is basically really for bomb making. So they're basically signaling that that the most urgent issue for the United States remains Iran's nuclear program. And yes, we can talk about ten things and be talking about for a long period of time, or we can focus on the one thing that really matters to you and the th the one thing that really matters to us. And I think this is a logic that the Biden administration has bought into. And then it, it want, once you're back in the deal, then there are three things that need to be negotiated. Expansion of the deal itself to address some of the issues that the United States and its allies care about, the regional issue and the missile issue. Now, where the problem arises is that the first one can be done by the P5 plus one. You know, you could just continue talking about more nuclear concessions for more new economic sanctions. But the issue of, of, of proxies and missiles is a regional arms control issue. I mean, the Iranians will also bring to the table, uh, you know, Saudi and UAE and Israeli military capabilities. And uh, before they agree to rein in Hezbollah or to limit their, their, their missiles, and that becomes a very different kind of negotiation than the one that uh, we have with the nuclear program. And so um, this is part of the, f the fun part for, for me, at least, and I think for both of us um, to to for me to play devil's advocate, but for really for you to respond to some of the criticisms that are out there. And, and there are many. I mean, let's let's be honest. Iran nuclear deal um, was opposed by three of the top Democrats uh, in the Senate. So this is not going to be easy. So first, the argument overall. Uh, which is a moral and political one. Uh, and again, I mentioned three Democrats, that is Majority Leader Schumer, S Senator Menendez, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, argued, why are we giving Iran a deal as a political and a moral um, uh, opening when, and I'll update the, the argument, France just announced that you know the Iranian government instructed someone 
uh, to, to launch an attack inside France, that Iran's uh, malign activity continues, uh, not only with Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria, but with the Houthis, who we now see uh, the ability, Israel says, to attack southern Israel, uh, and obviously uh, attacks much more recently uh, on um, Saudi airports, including a civilian airliner. So take that argument on, which is a, a political argument in, in the U.S., uh, which, which the critics say is a moral one. Well, uh, uh, this is exactly the, the, the hindrance that the administration faces, in other words, and that's why they, they, they didn't go out of the gate uh, with an announcement on Iran. In other words, there is domestic opposition on the Republican and Democratic side, and the, 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 the saber rattling that Iran has been doing ever since uh, it went under uh, maximum pressure and even before that, it doesn't make it easy. But, but the reality of it is, and this is the case that the administration would have to make if it wants to go into the deal, is that the alternative to, to the deal is war with Iran. I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, the Iranians can keep escalating. They can actually carry out an attack. Uh, they can uh, begin to really march seriously towards weapons. And then, we, you know, we're going to hear Israel beginning uh, with siren, you know, uh, calls coming out that Iran is six months away, three weeks away, two weeks away. Uh, uh, it, something has to be done. And then the, the United States also will begin to feel the pressure to prevent Iran going nuclear. And at that point, you would have to go back to JCPOA again. You know, the alternative is always a deal or war. It's not, it's not that Iran is, uh, we're ready to sort of open up relations with Iran or that we, uh, this is a normalization relation. This is an arms control deal. United States used to do these with the Soviet Union. Uh, President Carter met with Brezhnev. They signed an agreement on limiting the number of ICBMs that are pointed at each country. This did not mean that we recognize communism or we thought the Russians were any, the Soviets were any nicer day after the deal than they were before. But uh, what the, what the our opponents of JCPOA are saying, they don't have any alternative other than to say, keep the pressure on. But the Iranians will begin lashing out and that lashing out or marching towards nuclear deal will put us on a path to war. Uh, so so we basically don't have too many options. The option is either you persuade Iran to stop enriching uranium, and then you try to address other things, or you basically will have to, will end up in another Iraq war, this time with a larger country. Well, we're not going to relitigate JCPOA, so I'm not going to go too far down that road. We still want to keep pushing forward from today and forward. And the tactical criticism of what the Biden administration is talking about uh, is this, that history shows Iran only responds to significant pressure. And that if the US were to re-enter the deal, which requires the US to lift sanctions, uh, and then after that, approach Iran and say, look, we wanna talk about your missiles. Uh, we wanna talk about uh, your support for proxies uh, around the region. Iran will shut the door in the US face. And so that's an argument for not re-entering JCPOA. Can you respond to that argument? Well, uh, yes, you're correct. I mean, the minute as economic pressure gets lifted, the, the, the pressure on Iran to make concessions gets reduced. Uh, and similar with us. In other words, once Iran is not uh, uh, two weeks away from a bomb, once, it, once the break ta breakout time is beyond a year, we're also less incentivized to, to lift sanctions. I mean, this cuts both ways, uh, that, and that's why the Iranians are trying to create leverage now by becoming more nuclearly, nuclearly speaking, dangerous. But you know, in some ways, we put we've, President Trump has put American foreign policy where it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, he 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 scuttled the deal, uh, was not able to to do anything other than make the situation more tense, and Iran has become more dangerous, and we are now uh, in in that sort of a bind. But, but largely, you know, regional, I, I believe fundamentally that regional uh, and missile issues cannot be addressed with, with, unless there is a change in the, in the entire way in which the Middle East works. Currently, we have an arms race between Iran and its neighbors. We supply hundreds of billions of dollars to those countries that are Iran's rivals. So long as these countries are rivals, uh, the Iranians will, will continue to invest in weapons of their own and, and their proxies are part of their weapon system. So without some kind of a 
move towards normalization between Iran and its Arab neighbors without an end to the war in Yemen, without an end to war in Syria. I, I don't see, we, we don't even have a context to talk about those sets of issues. And then with, with the United States and Iran not even being able to agree to, to implement the deal that they signed before, how can we expect that they can even think about another deal? Uh, and that's actually the tragedy of the Trump administration. I mean, the JPCOA may have had a lot of shortcomings for both sides. Uh, the Iranians didn't get everything they wanted out of it either, but at least it was a basis you would have built on. And now we basically are back to where we were in 2013. But those, but those concerns are real. That's actually what makes the Iran, the Iran issue so complicated. And so if those are, are the arguments and I gave you the chance to respond to kind of the, the big arguments uh, about why this policy, uh, why the Biden administration is pursuing this policy, let's get into the nitty gritty a, a, a little bit. Um, uh, as you suggested a little bit, there's a sequencing question mm -hmm. here. Uh, so how do you fix a geopolitical game of chicken? in which the U.S. says Iran has to go first and Iran says the U.S. has to go first? Well, you know, this is both really directed at the domestic constituencies in both countries. Uh, in Iran, there are two issues at play. One is Iranian nationalism, which is uh, Iran wants to be treated uh, as a sort of an equal at the table with the United States and the other members. So it basically says, and this is the, what the Iranian parliamentary law that was passed to force the government to not comply with the nuclear deal was that Iran should not be in more in compliance than the other signatories. So since they haven't been in compliance at all with, with the US withdrawal and maximum pressure, they are demanding that Iran reduce its compliance. And the Supreme Leader of Iran said, yes, I agree to compliance with compliance, but we are not a lesser third world country, it shouldn't be treated that way that we, we move way ahead of the US for every step the US takes, we have to take six. He basically said US has to catch up with us because US is less compliant and then we're willing to go you know, in tandem with, with one another. Uh, that's the nationalist rhetoric in Iran. Uh, then there is the question that you know, Iran has presidential election coming up. Uh, the, the pace of the JCPOA would be quite critical to, to the elections. In others, right now, no more, only one person has formally announced, largely because if JCPOA is moving back on track, probably more moderates will run. If it seems like it's not going anywhere, moderates will not participate. It will be much more of a conservative victory. And demanding that the US do things first and do things more is a way for conservatives to sort of try to kick, down, kick the can down the road a bit so that the Iranian elections would favor conservative victory. A, a, a much quicker restoration would favor moderates in Iran. Uh, in the United States, uh, the president has to make sure, as you said, that he, he gets some kind of a consensus in Senate, in Congress, within his own party that would, that would be supportive of this. And, uh, and, and the problem is that there is no negotiation between them to even negotiate about the choreography of how, how this is happening. I think for this to work, uh, you, you probably President Biden will have to make some kind of executive order announcements, maybe on things that are not part of the nuts and bolts of the, of the sanctions, but are the more obvious egregious things that have been put down from designating Iran's central bank and its foreign minister as terrorist organizations to uh, blocking the IMF from considering a loan to Iran to blocking, you know, money that South Korea owes Iran. So these are these are sort of uh, things that could m maybe move the ball forward. Uh, and then and then uh, the United States w can say that it is coming back into JCPOA once it's a member of JCPOA. It has a right to participate in the Joint Commission and. And I think, uh, you know, if the United States does not come back in, if President Biden continues to drag his feet on this, uh, I think at least the Russians and the Chinese will tell Iran that Iran was right to distrust the U.S. And that, uh, you know, there's no difference between Biden and Trump. Biden is basically trying to use Trump's leverage to continue the same policy. If the U.S. is back in JCPOA, then Iran is not really confronting the United States. Iran is confronting the other five. And everybody, including the Russians and the Chinese, would put pressure on Tehran 
to basically start moving uh, as well. So, so I think partly it's the, the U.S. has to think about how does it impact the other five members and get a un, sort of a united front against Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, and currently, that's not the case. So, so let's just put a point on this because these are the tactics that that the administration is talking about and that Tehran is talking about. It seems like you're suggesting that the statements so far uh, from Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, uh, even the spokespeople uh, Ned Price, Jen Psaki at the White House, that Iran needs to get into compliance, and then we'll see what we want to do. It sounds like you do not think that is the wisest course. No, because you see, uh, uh, you, uh, I think it's based on an assumption that that uh, it is not a given, and the assumption is that the Iranians are bluffing and that they don't have a really a domestic politics. Uh, the reality of it is that uh, there is a there is a powerful faction in Iran, particularly in the revolutionary guards, that is arguing that Iran should not return to the JCPOA at all that they're saying that this was a mistake from the beginning. It was a trap. Uh, it, it, uh, it only made the United States more aggressive. They are arguing actually contrary to what many in the US think that Iran is currently selling more oil than, than the, the administration numbers suggest, that it has survived four years, it can survive two more. Uh, maybe it's not looking to, to do this for 10 years, but it can survive two years more. Uh, it can actually uh, uh, force the United States to choose between war and giving in. So they're saying, why you want to negotiate now when they feel confident? Let's move towards being only two months away from a bomb, and then we'll see how confident the United States is going to feel when it really has to think about, are they willing to go to war with Iran or are they, do they want to stop this? So, so they are actually saying, this is a mistake. Hold off. Don't do this. Uh, and, and there's a group in Iran who argues that Biden is actually more dangerous than Trump, because much like President Obama was much more acceptable to the Europeans and was much more successful than the Europeans, President Biden would be much more successful with Europeans and others in isolating Iran. And then the Supreme Leader actually for now has taken a middle ground. He has said he will accept compliance for compliance, but then he's put down these red mar- markers uh, that you know the United States cannot expect Iran to be ahead of it in compliance and that, uh, it, you know, it has to be in, in tandem. And, and he actually has said that the Iranian government is obligated to follow the lead of the parliament, which has mandated Iran has to start enrichment if there's no Western compliance. And on February 21st, uh, by law, the Iranian government has to leave the additional protocol and significantly restrict the work of inspectors. And in, even in his speech, the Supreme Leader very clearly, after putting the red lines down, said the Iranian government has no option but to fulfill the parliamentary uh, uh, decree. So those, these are also real. Uh, this debate in Iran is actually uh, quite real. And so your suggestion that that is not a bluff, that this is real, um, seems to suggest uh, a pretty profound point is that the US needs this deal more than Iran does. Is that pretty much what you think, or at least what you think Tehran believes? Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's where Tehran believes, exactly. Because they're, they also watched uh, what happened on November 4th, what happened on January 6th, what happened on January 20th. Uh, they they're also uh, uh, understand the economic pressure in the US. And then their view of of where they are is a bit different from uh, the perception in Washington, which is they've survived the worst that the United States could throw at them. And they're still standing. They're still in Syria. They're still in Yemen. In fact, it's uh, it's the Saudis that are being forced to throw in the towel in Yemen. Uh, And and that, you know, as I said, they they don't want they, they may not be able to sustain this for five or 10 years. But I think they're confident that they can sustain it long enough to get much more nuclear capability and really put the United States in a position that it would have to contemplate war. And and their calculation is that neither this party nor the Republican Party, nor and, and particularly not the progressive wing of the Democratic Party would want war and that the United States really can't afford war. And, and, the, and, and therefore, uh, they're, they're thinking they do have leverage 
sanctions is not the only leverage out there. Hmm. Bad um, behavior or, or dangerous behavior is also leverage. No, absolutely. And, and that behavior continues. Uh, let's go to the region now. Uh, I've got about 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, we'll open up for questions. Um, and let me start with, with a broad, uh, almost intellectual question, uh, which is that we're looking here, we're talking about Israel, of course, we're talking about Saudi Arabia, uh, we're talking about Yemen, we're talking about the UAE and, and the interaction with Iran, and of course, can't leave out Iraq. But uh, zooming out, keeping this in mind, the, the Biden administration approach, do you believe that there's more of an interest in the Biden team in confronting the adversary, in this case, Iran, or in actually controlling U.S. allies and making sure that U.S. allies don't get the U.S. in trouble. And, and of course, this, this really is a question about Israel and, and Saudi Arabia when it comes to Iran. I think both. Uh, I, I think, I think if, if you don't want to have Middle East continuously consuming the president's time, uh, the National Security Agency's time, is that you have to bring it back, push, bring it back from from the edge of war. Uh, you're you're not going to sort of think of it as George Bush did of, of building a shining city on the hill. It's not going to be democratic and a love fest in the Middle East. But there could be some kind of a cold, if you would, stability that 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 the United States would not have need to have multiple aircraft carriers and hundreds of thousands of troops. And as I said, the president, the secretary of state don't need to sink so much diplomatic effort into it. Uh, so, but that requires, as I said, to, to arrive at some point with Iran where we're more stable than we have been under the Trump administration on nuclear front, as well as in their behavior in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Syria. It also, so, so that starts with JCPOA and then it might lead to other agreements. I mean, the United States needs Iran on its exit from Afghanistan. It needs Iran to finish the war in Yemen. It needs Iran in Iraq. It doesn't mean uh, that we're gonna be friends, but we could go back to where we were in 2008, 2009, when every Iraqi prime minister was basically uh, a choice of Iran plus America, right? So we can not arrive at that sort of a, uh, place or like or or many people think about that there is possible to engage Iran and Afghanistan in a better context as we did in Bonn in 2001. Now the other side is to make sure that that the tail doesn't wag the dog, which is that uh, that our allies don't don't do things in order to keep us there. And uh, and and I think the shot across Saudi Arabia's bow the past couple of weeks has been very significant. But I also want to say, you know, the Middle East is now more dangerous than it was in 2016 because it's not Iran-Saudi rivalry. In fact, I have, I, I mean, I probably, Houston is more con controversial to say Saudi Arabia is a declining power in the region, largely because of petrodollars and the change in the geopolitics of oil. But also, if you look at it, they folded in Syria, they folded in Lebanon, uh, they, they, and they also failed in Yemen. So this is not a regional power that can stand up to Iran in, in any meaningful way. Iran's real rivals in the region are Turkey and Israel. And in fact, the Abraham Accords is more, I think the Gulf countries becoming junior partners in an Israeli-led axis than Israel being a junior partner in, a, in, a, in an Arab axis. The military power in the region in, in, among them rests with Israel. Iran is worried about Israel, not about Saudi Arabia and UAE. And on the other hand, you have another gorilla in the, in the cage, which is Turkey, which is occupying northern Syria, is building its influence in, in Lebanon, is, is involved in Libya, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, it's becoming a big player in the region. And, and the three of them are, are, are in a very aggressive uh, competition with one another. That's what the United States needs to control. It's, it's about uh, making sure that, that conflicts that are on the ground don't flare up as, as these, as these uh, countries compete with one another. Zooming into Yemen, uh, the U.S. has named uh, a well-respected, bipartisanly well-respected uh, diplomat named Tim, Tim uh, Lenderking as the senior envoy to Yemen. Uh, the policy is to try and end the war in Yemen through some kind of diplomatic solution. And the announcement that the Houthis 
uh, we're no longer going to be a global terrorist organization. That was an announcement made in the final days of the Trump administration over the objection of humanitarians uh, was just lifted. The critics of that, uh, Vali Nasser, say that this is an example of the Biden administration giving too much already to, if not Iranian proxy, a group that gets Iranian backing. And that by lifting that global terrorist organization before the Houthis gave anything themselves will actually make solving Yemen, bringing peace in Yemen more difficult because the Houthis have less incentive to give. Uh, and less incentive to sit down at a negotiating table and, and agree to a peace. Uh, so take that argument on, and, and where do you think uh, there can be progress made in bringing peace to him? So, uh, you know, the, uh, Secretary Pompeo put that designation on Houthis exactly to prevent diplomacy. Uh, the designation of ter terrorists, uh, whether it's the Taliban or the Houthis, it doesn't bother them. It, it, it hampers our ability to engage in diplomacy. I remember when I worked for uh, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, when we were, there were the beginnings of pot possibility of having conversations with the Taliban, the designation prevented travel, for instance. You couldn't meet with them. They couldn't easily travel to Doha. In other words, it was more, more a limit for us to, to, to engage in policy than with them. So I think the administration's right. The, 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 there was no logic for, uh, for the uh, uh, Trump administration to designate the Houthis other than to create a poison pill to, uh, an, to prevent any kind of an end to the war. So again, the United States has options here. It can continue with this war. The Saudis has pro have proven they can't win it. There's over 200, uh, uh, 230,000 people ki killed in this war, mostly civilians. Many people in the State Department believe the United States is running the risk of, of being accused of war crimes for supporting bombings of civilian targets and so many civilian killings. Uh, and so uh, ending this war, uh, in a way, is a favor to Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, it's, it's Saudi Arabia's Vietnam. Iran is not really expanding much. Uh, the Houthis will continue to fight. Uh, and so... Uh, if, you're not going to end this fi fighting without uh, providing some signals that the policy has changed. And I think that the, the designation lifting is a signal to Saudi Arabia, is a signal to Iran. And in addition to, to Tim Linderking's appointment, which you're right, is an, is an excellent diplomat with a great deal of experience there. Last week, for the first time, uh, the UN Special Envoy for Yemen went to Tehran, which clearly suggests that the administration is keen on getting that, uh, that, that portfolio moving and, and, and ending that war. You, uh, you, you joked when I asked about whether the U.S. would be interested in restraining, um, restraining partners, restraining allies, uh, that, that you don't want the tail to wag the dog. And so we've talked a little bit about Saudi and Yemen, and, and I'm running out of time. So let me just go straight to Israel. It seems to me that you could imagine a scenario in which, as the Biden team makes the, the theory of the case that you did, that the nuclear is what would bring the U.S. back in war. And that's what we're focused on. And yes, we're going to try and do these other things. Um, you know, uh, the, the Saudis, the Emiratis would have a conversation, talk about Yemen, talk about their interests. Uh, but presumably have a real dialogue and, and kind of hear the Biden team out. It seems difficult for me to imagine Benjamin Netanyahu agreeing to any kind of support, to any version of an Iran nuclear deal that would do exactly what we've been talking about, try and handle the nuclear weapons so that the risk of war reduces, the tension reduces, and maybe we can get to these other things. Um, is that right? And what should the Biden administration know about Israeli resistance to this, given that we've seen it before? No, you're right. I mean, uh, uh, Israel has its own read on the Middle East. It has its own read on Iran. Uh, and also politically, uh, it's the questions of war and peace, diplomacy and war may play out very differently in Israel than it does in the United States. Uh, and uh, the, right now, I think they will they will be making a lot more noise in order to persuade the Biden administration to put more of their demands on the table. 
So even if we, even if they're expecting there would be a deal with Iran that it would be smaller, more limited, and uh, would give Iran less, and the normalization would would be much less. But in the end, you know, the Biden administration has to decide how much veto power it's going to give Israel, and how significant it is for it to uh, to basically follow Israel's lead here, because following Israel's lead here actually requires the United States to maintain the same level of commitment and risk war with Iran. Uh, and, and that uh, basically precludes America's ability to attend to China, for instance, uh, which is not a concern for Israel, but it's a concern for the United States. Uh, let, me, let me put it this way. When 9-11 when, when happened, uh, many people later on said that the big winner of 9-11 was China. Because the United States took, uh, took its eyes off of East Asia and focused on the Middle East, spent trillions of dollars, two endless wars, and the result was that China got two decades of development, and we are where we are. If we end up with a war with Iran, we'll give China another two decades, because it's going to be all-consuming. There is no easy exit here. So uh, the United States calculations here about how important the Middle East is is not the same as Israel. Israel lives in the Middle East, for it, Middle East is everything. For the United States, it's a region that should be second, third, or fourth in terms of order of priorities of where its resources go. And that's going to be very tough. Uh, contrary to, to what assumption is, we don't see eye to eye with Israel in terms of how important uh, the Middle East is. We, President Obama's main problem with, Bar uh, with Bibi Netanyahu is that President Obama wanted to wash his hands of the Middle East. And Bibi Netanyahu wanted to keep the United States in the Middle East. And so, you know, Biden has his work cut out for him uh, trying to go around the Israeli objections. Um, all right. So we've got about uh, six, six, seven questions or so. I'm going to uh, combine a couple of them here. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes, just under 20 minutes. Uh, something that I haven't raised uh, is, is the first question from Pranav. And um, uh, I do struggle with this. Sometimes I go into the, the, the whole of geopolitics uh, and, and don't acknowledge what we're all dealing with, which is COVID, of course. Uh, and Iran uh, has an incredibly high rate of COVID, certainly at the beginning, and, and it's moderated a little bit since then. But uh, Pranav asks, does the high rate of death from COVID in Iran give Iran an argument against U.S. sanctions on humanitarian grounds? And is that something Iran is likely to bring up uh, in any kind of future negotiation or at least discussion with both the U.S. and the international community? Uh, I, I, it, it has, and it's very much reflected in Iran's own media and its own debates that the United States, uh, um, particularly because Secretary Pompeo made a lot of noise about supporting the Iranian people, uh, was, was willing to escalate pressure on Iran uh, exactly when the country was facing a humanitarian crisis. So um, it has not done any, anything for goodwill, let's put it that way. Uh, and, um, and, and so the government does blame a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, deaths on, on isolation and also looks at the way the U.S. handled humanitarian uh, um, issues with Iran uh, as, as, as signifier that it, it cannot be trusted and it, and it has ill intentions towards the Iranian people. And, and this is not just vaccines. For instance, it was a $5 billion emergency loan that Iran requested from IMF, which might have not gone through for many technical reasons, but the US blocked its consideration. It, it, it froze Iran, it, it wouldn't give waivers for Iran to pay for vaccines, for instance, uh, when it bought them from India and, and, and through World Health Organization. Uh, its access to pharmaceutical material, et cetera, was, was limited at the beginning because of the sanctions, and there were no waivers given, let's say, for particular kinds of uh, equipment or medicine, et cetera. And so should we expect that to change regardless of, of where the JCPOA or the re-entry of JCPOA goes? Well, I think certain things are good are goodwill gestures. I mean, I, I, I always say before, before you get to, first thing you have to show your honor, like it's with every government, we expect the same. You want to see proof that the change of presidency has meant something, that the Biden administration is not just the continuation of the Trump administration. So let's say on the war in Yemen, the president was very clear that this is a different administration. 
we're going to suspend this, we're going to do that, we're going to have an envoy. So uh, I think the humanitarian sets of things are, are the easiest way to sort of send a signal, not just to Iran's leaders, but to Iran's people, that, that you at least are separating issues of, of their suffering uh, from geopolitical issues. Uh, on the question of continuation or break from the previous administration, Sam asks the normal no, the normalization of relations between some of the Arab countries and Israel was uh, among the efforts of the Trump administration. Will the Biden administration roll back some of the promises made to those Arab countries? Uh, no, he won't roll it back. But I, but I want to say it's not a, 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 an achievement of Trump administration. I believe the Abraham Accords happened because of the failure of the Trump administration, because it made, it made Iran much more dangerous. And at the same time, President Trump was continuously telling these Arab countries that you need to pay for your security and we're going to be leading the region. So uh, I think it created a crisis of confidence that led uh, these Arab countries to look to Israel to fill in for, for the vacuum that the United States was, was, was leaving behind. But it's, an un, it's a sort of an unintended sort of achievement of the Trump administration but by, by scaring these countries of its own departure and, and a more aggressive Iran, uh, it has brought them together with Israel. But, and I think that's something that the United States should build on. And, and uh, now that that Rubicon has, has crossed, see how you can f further it down the road. Yeah, I, I was at an event with a, a foreign minister of a Middle Eastern country and, and let's just say that the, the way this official put it is that uh, they, they were convinced that uh, the U.S. would leave under Obama and President Trump convinced them uh, of that even more. So, um, but anyway, uh, all right. So a couple of questions that I'm going to combine here uh, on uh, Iranian leverage and, and some of the Iranian um, actions uh, that allow it to, to commit violence uh, and uh, have already committed violence. So I've got a question from May, and, and I, unfortunately, I don't have the name on the other one. We're going to combine these two. Um, so we've talked about Soleimani's death a little bit, at least I mentioned in the beginning. Um, is the U.S. worried that there could be more retaliation for that? There could be another response. Uh, and then a question about uh, supporting Hezbollah. Um, how does the support uh, for Hezbollah, both in Lebanon, but also in, in Syria, further Iran's goals? And what should the U.S. do about it? My, my thinking on Hezbollah is that Hezbollah is essentially a, a anti-missile weapon system for Iran. Uh, Iranians would say that, that if it wasn't for Hezbollah, Israel would be bombing Iran every Tuesday and every Thursday. Uh, without without any kind of a worry. So for a very long time, Hezbollah is basically something like Khrushchev wanted to do with putting missiles in Cuba, right on, right on America's door. It's a strategic weapon, although because it's made of people and, and it's, it's, it's not as clinical as just having missiles, uh, but it, it, Iran basically is not gonna wash its hands of, of Hezbollah so long as it is in this rivalry with Israel and in, in this rivalry with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. I mean, every time Israel has threatened Iran, people immediately say, well, Hezbollah is gonna attack Israel. That tells you everything. That tells you that that's, that's basically their deterrence and counter counteroffensive measure. So uh, Iranians don't have F-35s, they have Hezbollah. Uh, and, and they keep investing on that because it's been a very successful strategy for them. And now they, 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 are, uh, they, they are also present in Syria, they're present in Iraq, they, they have forces that they can deploy in Afghanistan. Uh, so in, in a way, it's a military strategy that supports Iran's position. Now, it, you could say it's a defensive way of thinking after Iraq invaded Iran, but it also has become offensive in, in, many, in many quarters. So I don't see th this proxy war going away without having a broader conversation about security around the region. I mean, the Iranians will not accept giving up missiles and, Hez and, and giving up on Hezbollah and militias if the United States is giving hundreds of billions of dollars in missiles, aircrafts, you know, sophisticated weaponry to, to, to their rivals. It's, it's about an arms race. On Soleimani, there is, there is pressure within Iran, within the Revolution Guards, uh, within uh, many sectors that they, they uh, he was popular with them. He was, uh, I mean, the outpouring for his funeral in Iran was, a, you know, was, was the largest crowd ever in Iran. 
uh, more than when Khomeini arrived, more than when uh, Khomeini's funeral. And, uh, and, and uh, I think the only way that we, we pass that hurdle is if there's a significant change and they come to see this as a folly of, a, of not of the U.S. administration, but of a particular American president. But that's looming. You know, there's, in other words, right now where everything in Iran was put on freeze until they see what to expect of the Biden administration. If there's no way forward, you know, those, those hardline dark voices will become more dominant in Iran. Um, Tia uh, writes about something that, that we, we should bring up more often. Uh, what role might the Kurds in Iran and Iraq play in the Biden administration's policy toward Iran? Uh, the, Kur the Kurdish issue in Iran has been dormant for a little while. Of course, it's sensitive, but it has not been a live issue. Uh, it has been in earlier periods of the Islamic Republic, but not currently. The issue, issue of Kurds in Iraq, uh, I think the Kurds in Iraq are now, right now, wedged between not just uh, uh, Iran and Turkey, but also the Arab government in Iraq. And with the United States, you know, poised to leave the region, I don't think the Kurds are in a very strong uh, position to play uh, to play a game. And also the Kurds have more worries about Tur Turkey's Kurdish policy right now than, than they, they have about Iran. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're going to be a major, a major factor. They will, they will be very important to the stability of Iraq. And, and, and to that extent, they of course matter to Iran. And, and, and uh, for, just to take a minute, we haven't talked enough about Iraq, I would say. Uh, and, and you have pointed out rightly that um, it, it is a country where the U.S. and, and Iran have worked together uh, in the past. Obviously, essentially, the Iranians were the, the ground soldiers uh, against ISIS uh, for, for so many years as the U.S. Um, uh, controlled the skies, uh, but also politically, uh, mm -hmm. of, of course. Uh, and and the, the, the pull, the, the tug, uh, the, pu the push and pull between the U.S. Uh, and, and Iran has been incredibly important for Iraq's stability and Iraq's political situation. Uh, do you believe that Iraq going forward would be a place where the U.S. and Iran can work together? Or is it more likely to be the place uh, where Iran will use uh, as a jumping off point, for example, to attack Saudi that we've seen before or to increase the cost on the U.S.? if the U.S. isn't doing what Iran wants? Well, I, I, potentially, but, but I, I think actually they better work together. I, I, the, Iraq is in a very precarious position. Its economy could collapse by the summer. It's, uh, yes, oil prices have gone up a bit, but uh, it, it, is, it is not functioning well. And uh, uh, if, if the policy that the Trump administration followed with Iraq, which is they were willing to uh, you know, choke Iraq in order to choke Iran, ultimately uh, may cause a, a major sort of collapse of central authority in Iran. That would be a headache for everybody in the region. Uh, it would be a headache for, for uh, Saudis, it would be a headache for Kuwaitis, for, for the United States, for Jordan, and for Iran. I mean, having a, a stable central government in Iraq, one that can function, what can, one that can have an economy uh, requires Iran and the United States to have some basic understandings about rules of the game in Iran. That doesn't that that existed until President uh, um, Trump came to office, and if and if we don't get back there, uh, you know, Iraq Iraq is in danger in that sense. Mm. Um, two questions about Yemen uh, that that all combine uh, from Mark. Uh, we talked about how. Uh, the withdrawal of U.S. support for offensive operations uh, to, to Saudi was a bit of a, an opening um, uh, to Tehran and, and to the Houthis. Uh, and then uh, Paul asks about uh, how the new Biden administration will influence uh, the war in Yemen and Iran's engagement in this conflict. And if I could just bring them together, how much leverage does the Biden administration have in order to get the Houthis to try uh, try and get them to the table? And does the U.S. really have the ability right now uh, to try and end the war or to actually bring the sides closer to uh, an ending of the war? Well, uh, you know, first of all, we have to say diplomacy is going to be tough. It's, it's not a given, but it's going to be easier than Libya or Syria because the number of actors are fewer. 
I mean, essentially, it's the Saudi UAE coalition, Iran, and then it's Houthis, and then the international community. So, so you're not dealing with multiple countries with, which are bordering on Yemen and have 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 separate agendas. But but the the the, the first steps for the United States is actually to take away incentive for war, uh, which uh, on the part of the Saudis, it is that uh, uh, if the United States withdraws its efforts, its support, does not supply it with bombing, with servicing of its aircraft, et cetera, then the Saudis will be more motivated to, to actually negotiate. And Houthis have never been averse to negotiations. They, they actually will want to consolidate their gains, uh, some of what they've got, uh, and 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 so they they, they are they have greater benefit from going to the table. In the past, the Houthis have come to the table. Saudis refused to talk to them uh, unless it was under their terms. And and then you know then it's the job of the United Nations uh, special representative and the, and the, and Tim Lender King to, to try to see how to bridge the gap. If if people think that the result of a peace deal in Yemen is that the Houthis will pack up, leave Sanaa hand over the keys, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. They, they fought so many years and they're not going to give it up. So, so there has to be some kind of a political arrangement in which everybody ends up with getting something and they can haggle over, over the bids. But like all wars, I mean, first we have to get to ceasefire. Then we have to test, uh, uh, you know, elements of a peace. And then once you get to peace, you need to uh, uh, have a way to protect the peace. But, you know, what I would say is that the United States got to peace in, in, in former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia. And many of the arguments were similar. Uh, there's no reason why this war cannot end. And look, over there, the Bosnians didn't get everything they wanted, the Serbs didn't get everything they wanted, and the Croats didn't get everything they wanted. But what Europe and the United States wanted was for the shooting and the massacre and the genocide to stop. Um, we have only a couple minutes left, uh, and I think we're out of questions. And so I'll take moderator's prerogative and and, la and, and ask uh, a final question. And I'll and I'll keep this thirty thousand feet. I don't usually plug uh, uh, books, but uh, I will use the title of your book to ask this question: "The Dispensable Nation: Foreign Policy uh, in Retreat, or, or American Sorry, American Foreign Policy in Retreat." And I wonder if, as we've been talking about. Um, Biden uh, speaking to Europe differently, speaking to partners and, and allies differently, uh, perhaps other than Israel, um, taking a different approach to the world uh, at the very least and how it speaks to the world uh, compared to uh, America first. There's a lot of talk about that re-engagement as, as Jake Sullivan says all the time. Uh, and yet I wonder if you believe that the American public at this point will support the kind of engagement, the kind of indispensableness, to use, to, 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 to take that word from the title of your book, that a lot of people think is required once again in order to solve some of these solutions. Or if we are in an era of, of the United States in which the American public will never support the kind of investment that the United States made after World War II, and if so, what's the implication? And, and specifically to the it's Middle a very East. Good but question. A very good question. I, I think I think not, because I think the American people very well understand that regardless of which side of the aisle they're in, they're on, that the biggest battle is 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 in their own country for their own future. Uh, and unless there is some urgent issue outside, I don't think there will be support. And let's not forget also that, that the most, uh, the, the part of the American uh, political foreign policy establishment that is, was most about world leadership and particularly asserting America's military power ended up as the neoconservative wing of the Republican Party. That wing of the Republican Party is now losing its influence to Trump. And if the, the battle that we don't talk about it within the Republican Party, we constantly talk about you know, all kinds of battles in the Republican Party is the foreign policy battle. That Trump has been steadily, as Trump rises, as this becomes Trump's party, it's gonna be a non-interventionist party. And, uh, and uh, maybe a Pompeo or a Tim Cotton or a Nikki Haley hope to inherit 
Trump's mantle and, and return the new conservative attitude, but it doesn't look like it right now. And, and then on the other hand, you have a wing of the Democratic Party, which has sort of uh, uh, shrugged the, the inferiority complex that the, Dem that the Democrats always felt on security issues, that they had to show their verve by being more hawkish sometimes than Republicans were. That wing of the Democratic Party no longer sees that as necessary. And so they are also non-interventionist. And so you have, a, you have a now a broad base within the American political system that is not supportive of foreign adventures, of, of American leadership that is costly. Now, if you're sitting in Tehran or you're sitting in Riyadh, this is what you're watching. It doesn't matter how much U.S. talks about re-engagement. You want to know what's going to happen in 2024 and in 2022. If they come to the conclusion that Biden is just a parenthesis in, in um, you know, a sort of a drift of America into somewhere unknown to us, and it's not going to play that role, you would be much more reluctant to believe in America's leadership, to believe in what it promises, uh, and you're going to play much more of a wait and see. And you might, that's true of Germany, as is true of North Korea, as is true of Iran, as is true of Saudi Arabia. And it's that, it's that attitude that has led to the Abraham Accord. Because these countries really no longer trust that the United States means what it says and that it has staying power. And so they look for another uh, patron. Hmm. And, and, and we are left with a national security advisor today, Jake Sullivan, when asked what his foreign policy priorities are, he says the number one foreign policy priority is fixing America. There you go. America's which means getting reelected, which means then, then you can have a foreign policy that people believe in. Exactly. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh, Dr. You. Vali Nasser, thank you so much uh, for joining. To the viewers, I hope you all enjoyed the program. Uh, have a good evening. And if you want to learn more uh, about the upcoming programs and webcasts that the Asian Society uh, hosts, please visit the website. Uh, thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Nick.